Hi there, and welcome to this uh, latest episode of Totally Unscripted. Um, so today we've got quite a bit to get through. So uh, in a second uh, or two, uh, Bruce is going to um, talk about the new uh, Sheets developer metadata, um, which is available now. Um, so this has got some interesting functionality within Google Sheets. Um, uh, before that, we got some news and releases. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, release updates. So we'll go through that just to highlight a couple of things. Welcome to um, Steve and Bruce, who who are joining us in the Hangout. I've shared the Hangout link if anyone else wants to drop in uh, and contribute to the, this session. So uh, moving on. So uh, what have we got? So in terms of news from Google, there's been a couple of things. So um, one of the things I always get asked is how sustainable is Google Apps Script? Will Google pull the plug any second? And there was a post recently which I think underlines more evidence that Google Apps Script is, is quite embedded um, within Google itself, which I think is a, a good sign. So this was a post on how the issue tracker for Google Apps Script, which is part of a bigger issue tracker that Google used for all their products, is actually there's lots of app script behind that in terms of notifications. Um, so there was a post recently highlighting this and as part of that, uh, it also highlighted that there are um, over 70,000 weekly active scripts within Google alone. So, um, you know, Googlers are, are having fun with app script. It would be nice to see um, some more activity from Googlers if they've got nice bits of script within in the communities. I know there's some within the developer relations team that share bits and pieces with um perhaps be good to be seeing a bit more um so the other big um announcement was uh, related to slides so previously there was uh slides api and slides uh, i think advanced service but now there's a slide service and also there's slide add-on so if you go into google slides there is the tool script editor so you can start coding away with bits and pieces if you previously used the Slides API, it's slightly different as a slide service. It's more like the Docs and Sheets uh, service. So there's a, uh, instead of doing kind of batch updates to slides uh, as JSON objects, you can uh, kind of drill down into individual elements of uh, slides. Um, Bruce, I think you've released something um, already on the, the Slides add-on front. Uh, well, actually, I've got a, a, an add-on that does both slides and sheets. So in other words, it, it's the same add-on. It detects which one it's running in. But because there's not really a way to publish it yet to be in both contexts, it's only working in the in the sheet mode right now because right. I don't want two different add-ons doing the same thing. So I'm just waiting for the ability to, to publish in both contexts, and then I'll, 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 I'll post about it then. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's. Is there? Have you got an issue ticket open that on? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, so we'll maybe take that out and share that if yep. people are interested in that, and um, they can start that. Um, I, uh, Martin, I also saw a question that was on the uh, Google Plus uh, community, where there someone was asking with the slide service, does it have uh, like cursor position where the cursor is? And I believe the answer is no, because we didn't see it there. Have you heard anything about? Um, I've looked at the slide service, and cursor position isn't something I recall being there. Um, uh, it's, it's not. Yeah, so it's more, it's less of kind of the Google Docs side of thing. Yeah, I don't uh, think it's a problem, because you can always put something somewhere, then people can yeah. drag things, right? So. I also I haven't looked to see if there are any event driven stuff. So on change, I haven't looked to see if there are any triggers um, uh, that you can hook into there for the development side. I don't know, Bruce, did you? So so don't forget what the slides service in, in App Script is is a uh, an App Script wrapper for the slides API. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the slides API is is not is not really designed to be container bound. So therefore. Unlike Docs, which doesn't have an API, in fact, um, it, it's not really as bound to the 
um, to the container sheet as, you'd, as the other ones are. It may come in time, but right now it's a wrapper for the Slides API. So everything you can do in the Slides API, you can also do in Slides, which means, of course, that you know you don't have some of those kind of interactive things. Mm -hmm. um, so early days, um, uh, but um, another nice to see again uh, the App Script platform developing and um, another opportunity for add-ons development. Um, so uh, some some more marketplaces for you to to start looking at. Um, so as part of the um, slides release, there, there was actually a blog post from uh, Lucid Chart, uh, just detailing some some of the bits and pieces that you know they would they did in the development. So if you want the kind of behind the scenes, you can look at that. Um, so there was a, quite a big outage um, in October, early October. Um, which uh, certainly I was trying to do some script projects at the time and I just gave up in the end. It seemed to, um, in terms of project creation within the, the cloud pl platform, there was an, an issue which impacted on Google Apps Script. Um, so it was nice, uh, Wesley Jim, who's a developer advocate at Google, um, actually posted on the Google Apps Script community just to um, update us on that situation. I think there were a couple of other issues in the tracker as well, recently related around performance. I don't know, Steve, if there was anything um, that you comes immediately to mind for you? Uh, no, no I, I don't recall anything right now. Um, so, you know, if you do encounter problems with that script, uh, general devices, uh, have a look in the issue tracker, see if there's anything for you to um, star and follow, or um, you know, post in the communities or the issue tracker uh, if if you're detecting something. Um, so it's actually been quite a busy period as well for release notes. Um, so this is from the Google Apps Script official documentation. So um, in September there there were some updates to uh, the Gmail service. So uh, around uh, draft messages. And also the, the priority inbox. Uh, there was also, as we've covered, the update around slides. Um, there were a number of calendar service, group service, and spreadsheet service updates. Um, so, uh, in the case of calendar, there were a number of new methods added. Um, I think some of these have been long standing issue tickets, um, they've finally been resolved. Um, so, uh, just to highlight those and um, the documentation goes into more detail about those. Uh, the other one is um, OAuth client verification for add-ons. So Steve, um, I don't know if you want, to, this was something that you picked up quite quickly and uh, I don't know if you want to talk to this a bit. Yeah, sure, just briefly. Um, it, it came to my attention when I was working for a client, uh, three add-ons were published and it passed, we got the acknowledgement that it was approved and then we went to the public, you know, domain to to look at it, and we and we got the unsafe warning message. And of course, I scratched my head to say that's not supposed to happen with the add-on process. So then I noticed the next day after uh, co contacting someone that they did change the process where before you uh, submit your add-on for review, you're now supposed to just like with other web apps, submit the form for the OAuth client verification process. So now that's a new step. It's no big deal. It's just an, an extra step. So uh, the continued evolution of that script. Did 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 you sense this causing frustration for people? Did anyone get caught in limbo between? Uh, well, I I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I don't recall anyone else on the add-on community uh, posting that. Mm. Um, however, it does remind me of a, another post that's slightly off topic, and that is I had a post out there a few weeks, a couple weeks ago, about um, some people were reporting a delay of the normal approval process for add-ons. Yeah. I think it was and, two weeks, wasn't it, or more? Right, right. And then I heard back from one of the Google contacts saying that uh, there was a delay, but they're back on track and everything should be fine. And so we went another week or so with no complaints, but then just this week, I saw a couple of people saying they're waiting a little long again. So 
Uh, I think it's just a matter of, you know, the flow of work they have during the week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just one of those things we have to be patient with, I guess. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's useful to know. And again, the, there is the G Suite add-ons community as well, where you can, if you've got add-ons, specific questions or tips and bits and pieces you want to share. Um, so um, moving on uh, to some of the community stuff. So um, uh, th there's quite a, a lot of stuff that um, has been picked up. So, uh, well, I've, I've kind of picked up and um, I, I, I thought I'd just go through a couple of these. So just kind of following on from uh, last month's Totally Unscripted, where we were talking about uh, Data Studio and uh, community connectors. So this is a way, basically, it's app script um, is used to provide data into Data Studio. Uh, and Dimu has uh, uh, posted um, something that was quite interesting. So in the official documentation for community connectors, it, it mentions create a manifest file within the script editor. And this just doesn't exist right now. So there is, uh, within the community connectors, it is, I think, a developer preview. So you have to sign up. So there's obviously uh, something uh, Google are working on around manifest files uh, for Google Apps Script. So um, when we get more information about those we, we, that we can share, we will. Um, so again, something else around uh, kind of something that appeared then disappeared rather quickly. Um, Barry Roberts um, uh, came across and managed to grab a, a screenshot of um, the, a script manager. Uh, which was uh, under the, the tools menu in Sheets. Um, so again, uh, we've got no more details on this. Um, so uh, again, indication that um, Google are tinkering behind the scenes. Um, this was actually a nice post I thought Bruce put in um, around the offset function. So uh, this is in um, uh, the Sheets service. Uh, so uh, there are a number of ways that you can use offset. The way that Bruce highlighted was um, just you know to grab the header row. Um, so um, uh, I thought that was a nice nice tip. Um, so uh, hopefully you can uh, start using that one in your script projects. Um, so here was a, another one that. Um, uh, are related to new Google Sites. So previously, with old Google Sites, um, there, there was a script editor in there, and you could publish uh, basically widgets and web apps within uh, the old Google Sites. With the new sites, there wasn't anything, but um, Google have uh, started permitting people to embed URLs. So um, uh, there's been updated guidance that um, Steve's highlighted um, on the official documentation of that the process. Basically, you're just publishing as a web app and then using the URL um, in Google Sites. Um, so I had a quick test of this earlier. And um, sometimes when you publish web apps and embed them in other websites, you get the annoying this, this app wasn't made by Google. So uh, that's not visible um, when you're embedding uh, a new Google site. So it's a very clean um, look. So um, again, you can start considering how you're going to use Google Apps scripts and new sites. So it might bring more people across to, to new sites. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, was there anything else? It, was this something you got to play with, Steve? Or um, No, I didn't actually play with it, per se. But before this, I wrote a Chrome extension to that was right, kind, yeah. of, kind of get you there. <laughs> uh, before before they uh, they had this, so uh, this is much better. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if someone wants to use the new Google Sites and have a app script web app um, embedded, it's possible. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one one bit of advice um, I think that came out of this comment thread is um, when you're putting your published web app URL in, make sure it's not your uh, uh, test the latest code version, so the one with the DV dev at the end of it. Um, you want the 
EX, EC uh, version, or, or that will cause you some headaches. Um, so this was um, another useful post from Demo Design. So um, just uh, it's probably worth just delving into that one. It, it, it's looking at um, how you set up push notifications in Google Apps Script, which isn't straightforward um, just because of your patch doesn't have all the, the header information that you need. So um, this is quite a nice approach to the community just detailing or outlining um, how you could do that with um, Firebase. Um, so uh, something else, uh, um, Andrew Rob um, uh, started a uh, community projects collaboration ideas list. Um, so um, basically crowdsourcing uh, knowledge, expertise, enthusiasm around different projects. Um, so there are various links there for you to submit stuff for that. So early days with that, but um, we might revisit that one and start highlighting some of the projects um, that get off the ground. So again, it's nice to see the community um, coming together and contributing on stuff like this. Um, so at the start of the show, I mentioned, and um, we mentioned last month, um, that there was a new Google or, or uh, well, there have been a couple of attempts, I think, of Google Apps Script uh, Slack channels, but we've got another one going uh, thanks to Andrew Roberts and uh, uh, John from Broughton, I think, have been the key drivers behind this. And um, as part of that, um, John from Broughton has actually developed a very nice um, Google Apps Script powered sign up form for Slack. Um, so um, uh, Slack can be a bit problematic sometimes. Um, in terms of signups, um, so uh, Jonathan's documented a, a very simple form. So if you've got other Slack communities that you, you want to provide a means for people designing up, um, you can check out Jonathan's article on that. And you can uh, sign, sign up to the Google Apps Script Slack channel as well. Um, I've, so uh, we've talked quite a bit in previous shows around um, Firebase. So this is just another uh, data solution around Firebase. How relevant this is going to be Google Apps to Google Apps Scripters? Not entirely sure. Um, at Firestore, it just seems like a bigger version of the real-time database with um, better querying. Um, so Bruce, you're quite a avid Firebase user. Is there anything in Firestore that caught your eye as useful? Yeah, I, I started to use Firestore on a, on a project I'm doing right now. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, it's more scalable than, than Firebase and it's got, as you say, better querying capabilities and so on. But aside from that, it's kind of pretty much the same thing. Um, it, it's, it's considered to be a document database rather than, rather than um, real-time database, although it actually is. Uh, so it's kind of like MongoLab, if you, if, it's kind of like MongoDB if you use that. Um, I think the, the recommendation from Firebase is if you're already using Firebase real-time database, then don't change. But if you're starting a new project, then may as well use this. So uh, as I say, I've only just started to use it in a new project. So maybe next time I'll tell you how, how I find it. <laughs> but uh, you know, the real-time database from Firebase is yeah. Is great, and you know, loads of people that use App Script also use Firebase. So I assume that they'll now move on to the Firestore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see if there's any interesting developments App Script related to that. Um, so uh, this uh, something from actually from Bruce. So um, there are a couple of uh, authentication libraries out there. Um, so uh, um, Bruce has got um, has been developing Goa. So uh, Bruce, you've recently pushed out a couple of new features for Goa, which I, I really like. I don't know if you want to quickly flag those. Yeah. So um, the, the the there's obviously lots of different flavors of OAuth two authentication, and the easiest ones are service accounts and so on. But the 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 more complex ones is where you have to ask for a user's authorization to be able to do something. Um, and the problem before is that you needed to create a kind of a, 
um, your own web app to be able to ask the question if it's okay to do something within within app script or sorry within OAuth two, um, which meant you had to create a web app or a sidebar or something like that, which was a pain because it had nothing to do with what you were trying to do in your in, in your script. So now Go is able to do that for you, so you don't have to care anymore about needing to do HTML service or anything like that. You just say, I want one, and you just got to say where about to put it. Um, so that was the first thing. And then additionally, I've added a few different kind of services and the different kinds of um, OAuth2 um, variations as they come along. It's, it's very easy to add them. Um, so I've provided a custom service to allow people to use services it doesn't know about. But better if you do do that and you do create a configuration for some service that I don't know about, then give it to me and I'll put it in so that everyone can use it. That's great. Um, I, I did a couple of YouTube examples recently. So the first one used the OAuth2 uh, app script library, and the second one used um, uh, Goa. So um, you can dig those posts out from my blog, and you can actually see the differences in terms of the setup. Um, and given this new development that Bruce is, I'll probably need to revisit that and show how you can do it even quicker. Um, but you can see, I, I saw, uh, found the Goa one to uh, one kind of the usual kind of learning curve with these things. But once you got your head around it, um, it, it it seemed very straightforward. And so um, I, I'm definitely a, a Goa convert. So I'll be Goa all the way from here. Um, so finally, just to highlight. Um, we're coming into uh, the GDG DevFest season. Um, so uh, Google have a number of developer groups around the world uh, and between August and the end of November, um, a lot of these, if not most, put on some sort of uh, uh, day of um, to, to bring the community together. So. Um, there's a link there, uh, and we'll share the slides after the show where you can find out a DevFest close to you. Um, if you're in London on the 11th, um, Bruce and myself will be uh, presenting in, in London. So um, if, if you if you want to say hello, please pop by. Um, tickets are free, um, but you do have to sign up. Um, so. Um, Bruce will be talking about Google Apps Script. Um, I'm taking a break from Apps Script to talk about Google Analytics. Um, but uh, hopefully there'll be uh, good events. So what we're going to look at is what's called Sheets Developer Metadata. They've been around now. Uh, they, they were in a, a kind of a preview state for a little while where the API for it was available, but it wasn't actually built directly into App Script. So you could get at it through the Sheets API, and of course you still can. Um, but now you've, it's also part of the Sheets Advanced Service. So you're able to use it directly from uh, from App Script. So it's a good time to get to know it. So first of all, what is it? It's a way of associating data with particular locations in a spreadsheet which is pretty useful. You could think of it as being like a property service, except with the added um, attraction of being able to specify a location. So what that means is, let's, say, say, let's just say this column in my sheet here. Um, now, let's just say that I want to know where that is from my app script. But let's just also say that someone could be changing it by changing the name of the column or inserting a new column, or maybe changing the name of the sheet on which it appears or something like this, then my app script might not work anymore because things wouldn't be where they used to be. Um, so that's what that's one thing that, that the Sheets metadata does is to track locations. So that column, even if I move it somewhere else, the Sheets metadata will keep it up to date to where its new location is. And when you talk about it and access it by a key that you give it, then it will know where it now is compared to where it used to be. So that's kind of like super useful. You can also have metadata at different levels. So you can have it for the spreadsheet as a whole. And what you might want to do there, for example, is to 
store some information, developer information about what the spreadsheet's for or when it was last updated or who updated or something like that. Uh, you can also have metadata at sheet level. So each sheet in your spreadsheet can have its own metadata. And you can also have it by row or column. So for example, I could have metadata about that row. And if that row moves somewhere else, the metadata will still point at that row, which allows me A, to know what it what I've stored about it, you know, as the key value pair of associated with the metadata, um, and specifically the location that it's now at. So I think that's pretty pretty smart stuff, and 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 it really makes a difference. I'll show you some examples of of, of how that can be useful, and and specifically how to use it in, in just a sec. So, just to finish with this spreadsheet before we move to the code, and um, what I'm going to work on is. The, I'm going to take a copy of this sheet so that we can play around with it without messing up my original data. Um, we're going to create some metadata for that column and for that column. And we're going to create some metadata for the spreadsheet as a whole and also for the, the copy of the sheet that, we, that, that we're going to make during the script. So let's take a look at the code. So we're going to start off by um running setup okay so the first thing we're going to do is uh, just copy the sheet so that's nothing to write home about um but then we're going to create some metadata now the, the thing is about the developer metadata is it's, it's kind of complicated the structure of the response that you get back and even the request that you make is also fairly complicated so of course there's a library to be able to make that a little bit easier but to start with we'll do it in, in, in vanilla um, script so let's take a look at that function create some metadata um so this is the function here and like everything in the sheets api that updates it actually does it in batch so in other words you don't do it one thing at a time or you can but you typically don't do it one thing at a time you make up a uh, an array of requests that you want to perform and make one request to the API and it does them all at once in sequence. Exactly the same as the slides API as well, which is which we talked about earlier on. So just before I go through the detail of what a request looks like, one of the useful things that I always do when using metadata is to is to copy the documentation, what all the different resources look like. And you can see there's quite a lot of them and they're fairly complicated. So rather than going back and forth to the documentation, I just copy that in here so I can quickly find out what it's doing, otherwise I get totally confused. So that's always a good thing to do. Let's get back to the function then. So my first job is to create some requests. So a request consists of an array of individual requests, and each individual request contains a property that describes the thing that you want it to do. So in this case, I want to create some developer met metadata. And that takes an object, which is called a developer metadata object, which is in that comments that we looked at um, at the bottom of, my, bottom of my script and also obviously in the documentation. And it looks like this. It's, a, it's got a, a label or a property of developer metadata, so it knows what it is. And then um, you can, there's a whole bunch of stuff in a developer metadata object. In this case, I'm supplying a key. So I'll be able to find that again later. And I'm supplying a value, which can be anything that you like, anything you want. I'm just adding a couple of things about when this was created. And then I've got a location, which is saying that this developer metadata object applies to the entire spreadsheet. And then I've got a thing called visibility. Now, just like the property service, there's a, the concept of, of being able to look at something, some data that's associated with a document um, or with a user and everything else. But in the case of metadata, there's two visibilities. There's document and there's project. If you specify document, this metadata will be able to be found by anybody who's able to access this document. By the way, when I say be found, it's only it's only visible through a script. You can't look at it in, through the spreadsheet UI or anything like that. You have to write a script to be able to see it. And the second 
uh, visibility you can have is project. And what that means is that the metadata is only visible through a script that uses the same uh, console project. And so in, in app script terms, that would be the same script typically. So it's if you think about the property service again, then you know that everything in, in each of the three flavors of pro property service in app script applies to the script that you're in. Even a, even a document applies to the script that you're in accessing this document. Whereas with the metadata, you can make the met, this metadata available to other things in the script that's wrote the thing in the first place. So in this case, my document is saying that anybody who looks at this document, any script who's able that's able to access it can see this metadata. Okay, so that's my first one. I'm, I'm, I'm creating something that's called spreadsheet details and I'm um, saying that the location of it is the entire spreadsheet. The second one I'm gonna write is for a specific sheet. So I'm gonna call this one, it's exactly the same format as above. I'm gonna call this one sheet details and I'm going to write some arbitrary data there as well. I'm just writing some things, it could be anything you want. Um, and this one for location needs the sheet ID of the sheet to which it applies. So that means that even if I change the name of the sheet or the, or the position of it or something, it will always still apply to the original sheet. The third one I'm gonna write is something that's at a row level. So what I want this to do, because I'm saying range A2, I want it to apply to Actually, I'm not saying that, I'm saying it through a dimension range. So I'm saying start index one, end index two, which actually applies to row two. In my spreadsheet, it's going to be that row there. So I'm associating some metadata with that second row in my spreadsheet. And the look, so the location this time, well, first of all, I've got that's its name, I'm going to give it. And the location that I'm giving it is a dimension range object, which is described at the bottom. And that needs a sheet ID, uh, what kind of a dimension it is, whether it's rows or columns, where it starts, and kind of where it ends. Now, that's probably a bit confusing because the start index starts at zero. So when it says one, it really means two in terms of spreadsheets. And the end index doesn't really mean where it ends. It means the one after it where it ends. Uh, that kind of sounds weird. But if you use JavaScript slice function, then it's exactly the same concept as that. Okay, so although that says start index one, end index two, it actually means row two, and it's only one, one row wide. Okay, and then the last one I'm going to do is this column. So it's exactly the same as before, except this time I say columns, and my start index is six and seven. So we go there, we're talking about this column here. Okay, and then I'm going to I'm creating one other one at a column level that we're not going to use right now, but we'll use later on. So we'll talk about that later. So I'm going to run something, and it's going to do the entire five things in one th in one one go. So here's how we apply that request. Very straightforward. Uh, we call the Sheets Advanced Service. Um, we call the Spreadsheets Collection within that. And we tell it to do a batch update and the request to use is that array that I've just created of all that stuff. So hopefully that'll, that'll work. Let's run setup. Okay, so it looked pretty good. Nobody complained. And uh, so in my setup, I've got a few logs going on. So we can have a look at what it wrote out. Take a look at the logs. So the first thing is the response from the API create batch request. Now, this is what came back from the Sheets API, and it is a, a maze of properties, as you can see, loads of stuff. And it's really quite difficult to make any sense of that. And that, so one of the criticisms I would have, in fact, about this, this uh, API, which I really like, is that the responses and resources are, are, are rather complicated, and it's quite hard to you know, when you're like six or seven properties deep to know what's going on. So I like to tidy that up a little bit. 
so I've taken the replies and selected out just the stuff that I want to see. I only want really want the ID, the key, and the value of each of the things I've just created. So if we now look, and I'm logging out here. So if we now just take a look at the the logs, the log again, and look at the second thing, which is the tidied version of that, which is here. Then we can see that we've just now got this stuff, which I'll just put into a JSON tidier up, so we can take a better look at it. Okay, so so now this is this each one of these members of this array describes some metadata that I've just created. So every piece of metadata has got a unique ID, which we can use to index it. Um, and, but it's also got a key. So these are the keys that I created. I get, I assigned these keys to it, and these were the values that I wrote. So I wrote five of these, so there should be five of these here. Let's, let's just check. There we go. OK, so that's that's a little bit more um, usable than than what came back from the API. Some of that information might be useful to some people, but this is all I really wanted to see. So now, let's see what else we've got. So the first thing we're going to do is to get, to take back some metadata by its ID. So this one is taking the first, just the first ID, the first one that was created, and it's using the Sheets API, sorry, the Sheets Advanced Service, Spreadsheets Collection, Developer Metadata Collection, and then the Get method to be able to take back what's actually stored this time. So these were created, these, these were uh, the response from creating the thing in the first place. So now if I use Get, I should be able to pick them up and see what, what they contain. So let's have a look at what we got there. Okay, so that was the result of that. So this shows us that we are able to, um, given a key, so in this case spreadsheet details, it could be in any of the others, um, you can go ahead and get back the values that you stored, in this case for spreadsheet level. So I could have written anything I wanted there um, and be able to get that back. And of course this persists, so if I close it and look at the spreadsheet in a month's time, it will still be there. Okay, so that was the most complicated thing that we'll be doing today, I think. Before I move on, has anybody got any questions? So, so can, you, can you, when you query the metadata, can you query it back by the ID it generates? Or? No, well, no, because typically you don't know the ID. Typically, you only know the key. Um, so that's what I'm about to show you how to do that in a minute. Okay. And just to reiterate, with this being a uh, document level, um, metadata. So, if you had a a standalone script running somewhere else where you and you have access to this spreadsheet, so it's shared with anyone with link, um, you could grab the spreadsheet by ID, and then you could get the metadata that that you've just written here out. Exactly, as long as you've specified visibility document. Yeah. rather than visibility project. Visibility project means only the script that created it can, can can read it. So that immediately seems like a huge, could be really useful within uh, an add-ons context then. That yeah, well, so. actually you can already write, you can already sort of do that mm -hmm. um, using the drive custom properties. However, they don't. They're just about the file itself. They're not. They're not locational. Yeah. These things can be. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let's move to searching now, because typically you wouldn't know those IDs, as Martin said. You'd only know the. You'd only know the key. So actually, we're going to start from now on. We're going to use a library, so we don't have to go through all that junk again. Um. Uh, but the but the library we can look at in some detail, or you can look at it later if you like. But for the moment, just kind of believe me what it does, and then we can cover it later on. But so the first thing we're going to do is search by key, um, and these four 
items were four of the five that I created at the beginning. That was the keys that we gave them. And um, each, so just to let you know what the library is doing in this case, um, it's doing the sheets, advanced services, doing spreadsheets collection, developer metadata, and the search method. And that takes this kind of an object. It takes some data filters. And data filters can contain lots of things, but right now we're just using the key. So it contains a, a, a developer met, metadata lookup. By the way, if you're familiar with the Sheets API anyway, or at least the Sheets Advanced Service, they use data filters already. So the developer met, metadata property has been added to data filters to be able to cope with this kind of data rather than the regular filters you find in, in spreadsheets. So this search by key is, is essentially doing doing that, okay? So we're so in this case, we're going to look up each of the four items we created, and then we're going to show some results for a few of them, okay? So let's run that. Hopefully it'll work. Um, okay, so the first thing that we got back, I've only, I think I've only printed out one of them. Yeah, this is the, just this one. So that's the result from having done a search. So again, you've got a fairly um, long-winded result. You've got a property that says what what it is that it's returning the result of, a match developer metadata, then a repeat of the data filters that you gave it, um, and then the key values, key and value itself, and the ID, and then location, and all sorts of stuff. So that's what that gives, and this is the column level one, which, if you remember, pointed to um, this column here. Uh, so again, I'm going to tidy it up, and in the library, I've put a, a tidy match um, function, which gets rid of all the stuff that you would get back from a, a search request. So now if you look at the log file again, um, the tidied version of that is this. So we'll look at that in a formatted way here. Here we go. So what we got back then is we searched by this key. We got, in return, we got told its ID, um, what visibility it was at, the value that I wrote to it, and but more importantly, its location. So it returns a dimension range object. If you remember when we created this in the first place, we got we we got to know about start index and end index and everything. So now that tells me that this this particular column um, right now is stored there. If I was to move that column, which I'll do later, then you'll notice that these things change. So you'll always know where that column is, even if it gets moved somewhere else. OK, so that's that. Let's get back to the script. What else have we got in here? Yeah, so another thing is that because the API is all about being as efficient as possible, then you can tell it to do many things at once, just like when we created it in batch in the first place. We can also tell it to um, do do many searches at once. So we're telling it to get four different things here um, all at the same time. So the search by key, uh, what will happen is it will blow this data filters out to include this kind of an object for each one of these keys. So now if we run it, we should get back all of it. So let's run it and see. Well, actually, we've already run it, haven't we? Just check the log. So this is the type, this is all the keys at once the tidied version of it, that is. And we'll stick that in here. OK, so now we've got one of those descriptions for every one of our things that we created. OK, so let's get back to what we can do next. So what's uh, really useful, though, is we've looked at how to search for things, but it would be great to be able to just get the data back without 
having to go off and find a location and then get and then generate a range from the location and then get in the data and everything and you can do exactly that so what this get data function is now going to do is to given our um, sheet details so to so recap, recap this says, says attack to add in to different parts of the sheet um, so and because he specifies it as a document level that's accessible to anyone else that's running a script that has access to that spreadsheet. Uh, and now we're just looking at how to use that data to grab the values straight off. I'm, I'm back, Mom. OK, so um, I'm using this other function, get tidy values, because now what I'm, I don't want to have to repeat all that code many, many times here. So, um, I'm using this function that's in the library called get by data filters. And what that actually does is it goes to um, the metadata that's got the key that you've given it, and it, it directly gets the data from the API without having to find the location and make a range and everything else. So there's a new um, there's a new thing that's been added to the Sheets API to be able to get data by its metadata key rather than by its location and everything. Okay, so let's run that now. Uh, get data. Okay, so that's that done. And so let's see what we're gonna get. Um, in each case, I've tidied things up a little bit, but we'll just take a look and see what we have. So what actually gets returned by the get data filters from the API itself is all this stuff, which looks exactly like what you get back from the Sheets API um, when you're just getting data in the normal way, not, not using the, the, the metadata. So there's a lot of stuff that's unnecessary, so I've got a tidied version of that. And you can see that what you now get is, in fact, just the, exactly the same data that you would get back from the uh, normal spreadsheet app so that makes it that makes it easy to integrate into any apps you've already got because the data looks exactly the same um, so that was the data for the sheet level so what we've got here now is, is uh, I've just taken the first few characters of it but it's um you know data for the entire sheet if I had let it print out you would see like zillions of rows um, and then the second one Again, you can see what came back from the API. Again, this time it's a column. It's just a, just one column. We're using the municipality column key to be able to get it. And being tidied up here to look like what you would get back from a, a range that was just one column. And then in this case, we're, we're just taking one row. This is just the first row. So all that worked. You think about it, it's pretty cool because you managed to get back that without needing to know anything about where that column was um, because it's all in the metadata. So what that means is that if you've got a script that creates data and does all of this, and then you've got other scripts that want to get that column, they don't have to know anything about the structure of the spreadsheet whatsoever. All they need to know is what the name of the key against which it was stored is. Okay. So, um, any questions before I move to the next thing? That all seems very straightforward, um, particularly mm -hmm. with your library. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah it's actually, to get it back as a 2D array. It, it, it's actually um, pretty straightforward without it as well. But the, the thing is, you, you, you have a lot, of, you create a lot of errors for yourself by getting the structure of the data wrong. So, just to get rid mm -hmm. of it is the best thing to do. Um, and uh, about again, data for a particular cell. Now this is really handy because let's take an example. Let's just say that we wanted to get the data for um, for here. In other words, the intersection of the municipality column and the first column here. So I want to get that value there. Now we've got a, a metadata for that column. We've got a metadata for that row. Now you can't um, 
create the metadata for a cell. So you have to have a way of figuring out what the intersection of two metadatas are. Now, there isn't one available in the API, but there is one in the library here. Um, it's really not, It's I, I won't bother going into it right now, but it just looks up both of these both of these metadata figures out the range that it's at and figures out the intersection. It could be one, it could be one cell or it could be like multiple cells. It's just a, a square, if you like. Um, and what it actually returns is not a range. It returns a function with which you can make a range. And the reason for that is because when I kind of try and when I make a library to not um, take any top level object over into the library, mainly for security. Because if you have a library and people pass their spreadsheet app to that library, for example, you don't really know what the library is doing with your spreadsheet app. So I prefer not, not to even let that happen. So what this does instead is to return a function which is able to work out a range. Okay, and, and that will become, if that sounds complicated, it'll become clear in a minute. Um, so we're taking back, back this function that makes a range. And then we're just going to take a look at what that looks like in a minute. And then we're going to make the range. And to it, we're going to pass the spreadsheet that needs, uh, the, the, f in from which to make the range. Okay. And then we're going to use the regular um, spreadsheet app to be able to get the values that are associated with that range. You could have got the background colors or anything else, but I'm getting the values in this case and then showing them up. So let's run that. Uh, okay, and we'll take a look at the result. So there's the answer. That's this Port Mosby, which is exactly what we wanted. So we're looking at the wrong sheet. We're looking at that, that sheet. Um, so we're looking at the intersection of that column, which was the first one, and the municipality. And the function that it returns, by the way, is this. That's the code for the function it returns. And it uses something called closure, which you may or may not know about. But that's a way of, of embedding data from another function uh, in the state it was in when the, when the function was created. So that's how that can work. OK. so. Now this is this is the magic because now so now we know that we can get data from a particular cell by running that. So what happens if I mess the spreadsheet up completely? Let's say that I insert a column to the left of that. And now if I run get cell data. Uh -huh. We still got the right answer, even though I've inserted another column. Let me get, let me comment that bit out so we don't get that each time. Um, so let's just say that I now take this and and insert it there. So in other words, I've I've, I've completely changed the the data now. Then. What we really want it to do is to still be able to get that value, even though it's not in the first row anymore, and even though this isn't in column G anymore. So let's see if it still does it. There it is, so it still works. So that's kind of pretty much it in terms of the um, how you might use it in a batch mode, but there's another really useful thing which I'll which I'll just cover in a second. It'll just take me about five minutes to do. So, but before we get there, is there any any questions? Um, um, so, so, when you make, when you make a copy of the spreadsheet, is, is, is the, the metadata, metadata lost? lost. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not code 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 code. no, it's not. No, 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 it's yeah. not. Because the because this the the metadata is well actually the obviously the metadata for the spreadsheet is still existing because um, that's at the spreadsheet level, yeah. but the metadata for the sheet is still applying to the original sheet and not the new one because it's because it applies to the ID the sheet ID and when yeah. you create a new sheet you get a new sheet ID so therefore it doesn't apply to that one it applies to the old one. 
on a, a spreadsheet level, the same thing. If you copy the spreadsheet, the copy uh, the spreadsheet. you know, I, I assume so. I've never actually tried yeah. it, but one would assume that was the case. Good question, though. Okay, so let's look. Let's look at something else now. What well, I'm going to, I do have a cleanup function here, which uh, I won't bother going into in much detail, but it, it's using the batch mode again um to create a bunch of batch of delete requests which we've got here so it's just exactly the same as before except this time we'll delete developer metadata and we can actually use the key to do it we, can, we but we can use the, the uh, sorry the we can use the id to do this but we can also use the key i find what's interesting is is this document level concept so yeah. you, you can write another script and if you know the keys to a particular spreadsheet in this case, you have access to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. Because I can see someone writing, uh, starting off at the higher level of Google Drive and leveraging known keys that you would have mm -hmm. to know to drill down, to, to pull out data. Yeah, I'm, I'm back, guys. So, I, I, so we were just talking about the document level stuff and how the uh, you know, a, a different script, as long as you have um, right access to the spreadsheet, you, you can access the metadata keys. Can, but could that be used maliciously and overwriting uh, your existing keys? Yeah, so I was just about to say that uh, when you cre use create uh, metadata key, uh, metadata item, I should say, then what you're going to do there is you're going to create an additional one. Um, so if there's a key A there already, you're going to create mm -hmm. two A's. So, however, there is a, an update. Mm -hmm. and, and so in other words, you can use um, uh, update metadata key rather than rather than create, in which case it will overwrite the original one. Although having said it, but the point is that you need to have uh, right access anyway. Yeah. But you can have read access and not yeah. read that. So if you're going to screw up some the spreadsheet, yeah. you could do one could more do damage well, than just well. metadata. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. If you've got right access, you can do whatever you like, right? Yeah. So yeah. metadata yeah. is the least of your. <laughs> um, OK, so so that's that. Um, where were we? Yeah, I was about to show something else. Let me. I was talking about deleting. So I can clean up either by um, using the IDs. And if there are obviously multiple um, items for a particular key, it's only you need to do them all. So, but you can also delete with using a developer met metadata object, which can have a metadata key in it rather, rather than a, an ID. So that will delete everything with a matching key. So I'm going to delete, and I'm now going to delete everything here that's got. That, that's got these keys associated with it. So I'll run that. Let me ever just run it, I can't remember. Um, and now if I run that search thing that I had at the beginning, hopefully it won't find anything. Yeah, there's nothing now, that's good. Okay, so we've cleaned up. And so we run setup again, which will um, create those those things. And all, also it's made a, new, a fresh copy of the the spreadsheet without any of that changes that we made. Okay, so now um, imagine that you want to now do uh, an on edit type type thing. Okay, actually I need to open this. I think I've got got one already set up. If I'm lucky, I do. Yeah, I do. So normally with an on edit, you're going to be doing something like this. Let's just say that I want to. Um, where's my sheet? If, let's just say that every time I change something in that column, I want the timestamp to appear here. Okay, it's quite a common thing that people like to do. So typically, what you do is you do something like this. You'd say that's the column that that I'm looking at for changes. That's the column to update when something changes, and that's the sheet for all the stuff to happen on. And then your on edit function, which would be a, a simple trigger, would if all those things matched, it would put the a new date in the column that we told it to put it in. So in other words, if I updated 
um, if I change this column, what would happen is that the timestamp would appear there. That's all great, except if things change, because if I put an extra column in there, then that script is not going to work anymore because it's going to be pointing at column seven rather than column eight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You could use a named range, of course, but named ranges are available through the UI, and people can change those too, and it still won't work. But what they can't do is to change um, developer metadata unless, of course, they've got access to that and can write scripts, but in, in principle, they can't. Um, so that means that um, developer metadata is a little bit more reliable for dealing with these kind of situations. So this is how you would write a, a, a metadata-driven version of that. So first of all, you can't use a simple trigger. You have to use a installable trigger. I don't know if I've set one up. Let's just check. Yeah, I've already set it up. So that's my on edit we're about to take a look at. And it gets triggered on edit. And the reason that you have to use a installable trigger rather than a simple one is because to be able to access the Sheets API, you need it needs to check your authorization. And an installable trigger happens after the authorization's been checked and a simple trigger doesn't. So you can't do things like um, that need authorization in a simple trigger, but you can do it in a installable one. So that's the first thing, you've got to install it. Um, and then, well, let's just see if it works, first of all. So if I change that column here, uh, and then what I'm hoping will happen is that a timestamp will appear here, and it did, okay? Change that column. Okay, so that all works. So if I install an extra column here, and then I do that. So if I do that, oh, that, that there, I should say. Then it still works. So if I install another column here, and do something down here. And it still works. So that's pretty cool. You can do um, on edit type things without worrying about people changing the the shape of your spreadsheet because because it, it tracks all that for you. And so let's take a look at how that works. Uh, wrong script, this one. Then the first thing I'm going to do is to sell. Uh, I'm not using the library here, by the way, because uh, I don't. I just wanted to show you how to do it in, in, in vanilla sheets language. Um, but I do have a little function to do a search from you. We'll look at that in a minute. So I'm saying, first of all, get the, get that column. Now, I could have done get both the columns that I'm looking for the address of at the same time. Um, but here I've done it, done it to make it clearer. I've done it as a separate search. And the first thing I need to do is to get the dimension range. The dimension range is that thing that says the start index and everything else. Um, and if I got one, if I got a dimension range, and the range that's being edited right now, the current start index of the dimension range that was returned by looking for the column that I was that had metadata associated with it um, and it's the right sheet ID then I'm in the right place so it's really it really is that simple just check the dimension range again that was stored which has been maintained automatically by the sheets API um, compare it to where we are at the moment and if it's the match then, then I'm good to go so if I'm here, I know that I'm in the right column. So now I need to go off to the metadata and find the timestamp column, because that might have moved as well. In fact, it did in the example that we just went through. So again, I use the same functions to get the dimension range. And uh, I just do the update as normal. And that's kind of it. Quick look at the searches. So we already looked at how to do a, a developer metadata search and the Previous example, so it's the same as before. We're just using the key um, and using the search method. 
and get them range is kind of like boring because it's got to go through the entire properties uh, resource that was returned by the search and it has to keep on checking to see if the property is there etc cetera, etc cetera. but eventually we end up with the match developer data location dimension range which is all of that stuff joined together essentially so you can see why I want to use a library right mm -hmm. um, anyway that's kind of it so that is a uh, super super good because all those problems you get trying to do things in, in uh, event driven spreadsheet type things like this those problems go away by using that idea so that's it I don't have any anything else um, I, I think there's I've done a few posts over the past few days with all the all the stuff that you're looking at now um, in order to you know in case people want to, wanted to understand a bit of background before this but if you want to look a bit more detail after it then I'm sure that it'll be on Martin's website and you can pick up from that I think uh, the worrying thing is as Google Apps developers, we should no longer be in a position of um, helping add-ons where if you get feedback saying, oh, does this work if I move the column around or something? Exactly, yeah. No excuses. Um, yeah. It's very achievable now. Um, yeah, I mean, b before we had to do things like use the, the column heading or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, we don't even have to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, one question to um, when you were setting up the, the the metadata on the sheet, you were recording um, some of your own values um, as part of that. Uh, what's what's the the size limit on how much? Uh, yeah, that's a good good question. No, no, they're they're, they're actually uh, quite annoyingly low on quotas for this. And I think um, it might have changed, but I think it's 30k right. is the total number of metadata you can have at the spreadsheet level, and then each sheet can have 30k as well. So that's not it doesn't sound like a huge amount to be honest, but uh, they might increase that at some point. Now the reason is, of course, that the metadata is stored as part of the sheet itself. So so that means that when you open uh, a spreadsheet um, with spreadsheet app then it reads the metadata as well and if there was like megabytes of the stuff then opening any sheet would take ages right so that so they're I think they're being a little bit cautious about how much quota they allow to begin with but that's it's it's quite low so you, you have to be careful what you use it for um, but having said that I think so I, I guess but I'm not sure the quota for any individual value that you write against a particular thing would be maximum 30 but minus any other metadata that you've included so 30k is the combined allowance on, on on a sheet level so if you've got 100 bits of metadata you're recording they're, they're going to have to be quite small I th yeah i think it's th and, and i say i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure of this but yeah. i think it's 30k per individual sheet so yeah. if you've got 100 sheets, you've got 30k times 100, right? Right, yeah. Well, that was um, a really interesting walkthrough. Steve, I, I don't know if you've got anything you want to ask or comment. Yeah, it's just another excellent contribution. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just interesting that you're elaborating on, um, it's a little different from the property service at the document level. Uh, I was just thinking if you if we had a script that says okay I want to start at the drive level folders and so forth if I know the keys at in this case at spreadsheet level that I can drill down right to, yeah. to get some information or or track things so that's so, very nice. so I, so I actually did a post about this um, a few months ago um, you, you probably know that a drive file has got custom properties available um, and, and it's like this you can you can write a value against a key um, and those custom properties are actually searchable through the drive API so the the, the, the body of the post was really or the, the purpose of the post was to say you know what you don't really need to know spreadsheet names anymore or spreadsheet IDs anymore 
if you write to the custom properties of the drive what the purpose of the spreadsheet is because then you can use the drive api to say give me my finance spreadsheet what's what what's my finance spreadsheet for august or something like that right um where the custom properties of that file contains it um and then that will return the id of the file um and then you could go to that idea that you could go to the file and then you could look inside that spreadsheet at the metadata to see how it was organized mm -hmm. um so those two things together are quite a powerful combination especially with the drive custom properties if you let's say for example your finance file for august sheet but that was all screwed up and now you've got a different spreadsheet um, you wouldn't need to tell everyone the new ID of it because it would be uh, in, the, in the custom properties of the new file and the old one would be gone. Mm -hmm. So all that things fit together quite well, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with that, I would just like to thank um, Bruce for his contribution and Steve as well um, uh, for his bit contribution as well. And um, we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.